Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Public Media. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Hello and welcome to Your Legislators. I'm Anthony Moreno. New Mexico's 30-day legislative session ended on February 20th. Joining us in studio to talk about this year's session is Senate President Pro Tem Mary Kay Papin. The Democratic State Senator represents District 38, located in Donina County. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, especially now the session is over. <laughs> we can take a look back and kind of analyze what happened here, yeah, and it's yes. going to be great to get your perspective. Obviously, these 30-day sessions are so much focused on the budget. The state legislature passed a $7.6 billion budget this year right. for the upcoming year. Uh, there's $528 million in for public works spending, and obviously uh, the tax credit for installation of solar panels uh, was brought back as well. Uh, what are kind of your thoughts on the session and, and what lawmakers in Santa Fe were able to pass this year? Well, I, you know, as, as any session, I, it's like the last 10 days of any session is where you really, the, uh, a lot of the work gets really done. You, up to that point, you're sort of building up and then you start really moving forward. Uh, you know, I think we were able to accomplish quite a bit for the state. I think the governor has a very uh, ambitious uh, agenda and I think we're trying to make uh, make sure that we can fulfill that agenda as much as possible for her. And of course, we as legislators have ambitious uh, agendas as well that may or may not coincide exactly with the governor's agenda. So trying to wedge your agenda in between with what the governor wants done is sometimes a little difficult to do. But uh, all in all, I mean, it's, it's uh, I, I said, it, I normally don't sleep late, but I came home Friday night and I slept till 11 o'clock Saturday <laughs> morning. So I think it's it's a steep uh, sleep deprivation time, and uh, you know just high energy and trying to uh, get things move forward and try and uh, balance. It's about a balance. Well, we're able you you were able to get some rest. We're happy to hear that. Um, I want to talk about a major issue, of course, this legislative sure. session: education. Of course, the state is facing uh, a lawsuit that the state was not providing adequate education for at-risk students. The Yazi Martinez lawsuit that uh, lawmakers and education officials are trying to address. Now, lawmakers passed a $320 million early childhood endowment fund, which expands childhood, uh, child care assistance, and also uh, education for pre-kindergarten for uh, young uh, students here in, in our state. I'd like to hear your thought. The governor signed this legislation, um, I, I believe, already. So. What is this going to do for education in our state? Well, I, you know, the uh, proof is in the pudding, so to speak, but uh, I think it is certainly going to uh, put the dollars out there. Uh, we've hired, uh, uh, the governor uh, has a cabinet secretary that she brought in from uh, Washington, D.C., and I think she's uh, strong. I think she's enthusiastic. I think she's really uh, interested in making a difference. I've met with her several times, as well as her meeting with some of the people that have early childhood programs and trying to work out the funding th that's going to go to those early childhood programs and the salaries that are going to be paid so that they don't lose the good people that are working in those in those facilities. Speaking of funding, uh, this is, this fund is going to be funded by uh, revenue with oil and gas. Um, now, obviously, we've seen that industry in the last few years uh, be a little bit volatile, and whereas like um, loss of funding and it dramatically hurt the state. Do you have any concerns about that funding measure that they're planning uh, with? Well, of course, I think it's foolish to not be concerned about that because oil and gas goes up and down. And back in 18, we didn't come out of the recession uh, like we had hoped we would or other states. So we were going after everybody's cash balances. 
And so it's something that uh, I'm glad that we're putting 25% in our reserves so that when we do have this downside of oil and gas, that we're not scrambling the way we've been doing in the past, trying to make ends meet. Uh, so I, I think it's, you know, I'm very grateful to oil and gas. I think they keep this state afloat. And I, but it's, we, we know it's not gonna be here forever. And it, and it can be very volatile. Now, some lawmakers have said they hope that this fund can reach a billion dollars, um, you know, within a matter of years. Uh, what are your, do you have confidence that it could do that? Well, you know, of course, a lot of it is going to depend on, again, on our finances, like oil and gas. Uh, so if it stays up, we'll be able to do it. If we're ha having to try and trim everything to the bare bones, you know, then we won't. But I think as, as it appears right now, I think we'll be able to do that. And I think it's very important that we do it. And I'm, I'm so happy that we have put this uh, whole program in this, uh, that the governor has hired this woman uh, who are, as the secretary that's gonna be here. She is so knowledgeable and, and we need to do this. And it's important and uh, you know, I think uh, there was a pope that said, give me a child until the age of eight. Uh, I don't, I, I believe that's, I believe that's the quote. I may be wrong on that. But I think it doesn't make any difference who said it, but I think it is the truth. You, it's that early childhood grounding that you get and growth and security and all the other things that go with that, that I think carry you through into adulthood that make a huge difference in people. Some state lawmakers have advocated for uh, tapping the land grant permanent fund in New Mexico to fund these measures, which has billions of dollars in that fund. What What were your thoughts on taking well, that, that I, action? I never have supported that. Uh, you know, uh, they keep saying, well, it's just a little tiny bit. Well, you know, you start cracking the, the door, you bring the door open and then we have all these other entities out there that would like to get in that door as well. And, and with good intention, I'm not saying the intention isn't good, but I think what we did with the early childhood with setting this whole system up is something that we can look forward to and it is specific for them. It's not just trying to take a little bit of here and then we have other things that will want to come in. We're, all we want is just a little bit. We just want a little bit. We just want a little bit. So you um, think it's like a slippery slope? It's like a slippery slope. And you know, because of our permanent fund, it's one of the reasons that our bond ratings are so high. So New Mexico, we have high bond ratings and that's very important when we go out uh, to borrow money and to do the things that we do. A lot of our capital outlay is sold on bonds. Uh, so I, I think in looking at that, it's something I'm glad we've, we're doing these things because we need to do them and we need to find the ways to do these without trying to get into that because the permanent fund is also invested and makes a huge amount of money. So that amount of money uh, goes back into education. It goes back into many of these other uh, entities that we have out there to help fund them. And so if we keep trying to take a little bit here, a little bit there, and a little bit here, then pretty soon the funding that are going to the things that are out there like education, th those amounts will have to go down because we're now fun have increased the pot, made the pot that much larger. New Mexico constantly is ranked low when it comes to child uh, care, child well-being. Um, do you think that this money for this fund is enough uh, in regards to early childhood education? Well, I, th I, th I think it is, but that's to be determined. Uh, I think that we need to make sure that what we're funding is what, what the needs that we have. We're a poor, we're a rich state in many ways, but, but we're a poor state in that we have a lot of poverty in the state. We have a lot of English learners. Uh, so it makes a difference, but we need to make sure. And the other thing I have to say is I think that we need to also make sure that the parents are engaged uh, in making sure that their children are at school and, and uh, that, that they are there, that they are attending school. I know at one point there was a uh, superintendent at Gadsden who came in and he said, there's no excuses. 
And he said, there's no excuse if your parents aren't a parent-teacher uh, nights. There's no excuse if you're not at school. There's no excuse if the teachers don't teach. And so I think in looking at it, it's some of the things that we need to also be looking at. Money is not the sole reason that we are where we are, but I think money certainly is a, a big piece of it. But I think hopefully we'll be able to, I'm very impressed with the new uh, gentleman, uh, Stuart, uh, who came in, who's gonna be head of the, of the PED. And I'm very impressed with him. Of the public education department. Of the department. public education department, yes. And I think he's gonna do a good job. But I think there are things other than just money that make a difference. Now you mentioned uh, accountability with parents, but I mean, what are the other things? Well, I think accountability with students. I think accountability with, with teachers. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the whole system, the way the whole system runs, and I think the accountability uh, is going to be, I think, very different under this, under uh, Dr. Stewart. Uh, I think he's a good administrator. Uh, he hasn't been in the classroom as much as, as maybe some, uh, peop uh, some previous PED people have been. But I think he's a fabulous administrator. I think he has, I think he has his eye on the ball. Now, people uh, who were uh, for this lawsuit, behind the lawsuit, um, uh, and uh, proponents for the students who were affected uh, with this lawsuit said that the funding wasn't enough, that they needed more funding uh, to really address these needs. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that are, it is my understanding, I, you know, I don't have all those figures, so, I, so I'm speaking off of, you know, without... But you're in the know. Well... You're up there. I, pretty much. Uh, but, uh, you know, we need to be spending the money and not holding the money. So the monies that, that are out there need to be being spent and put into the programs that need to be put into without putting in necessarily new programs unless they're new programs that are gonna insist, that, that will assist in children learning better and being able, you know, I think uh, I was not particularly involved with uh, the PED when uh, the previous governor was there, but I, I do think learning to read is a very important piece of it. And I think trying to uh, hopefully get parents to start reading to their children if you don't speak English, start reading to them in Spanish, teaching them to read in Spanish. But getting that mindset of, of reading is where, uh, where you start moving forward because you can't, you can't get a good job if you can't read. Yeah, I wanna move on and talk about uh, getting a job or creating jobs, economic development in the state. Uh, in the Senate, in the Senate committee, uh, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, uh, legislation to legalize and tax recreational marijuana uh, was held up this legislative session. Um, obviously, we've seen a number of states legalize marijuana. Colorado, our neighbor to the north, uh, recently has done that. And there's been a lot of push for this to bring in tax revenue to the state to help fund many of these programs that we've already been talking about. So I'd kind of like to hear your thoughts on that legislation and uh, would you support that? Well, up front, I don't support recreational marijuana. I was a strong supporter of medicinal marijuana, and I still am. Uh, when we say it bring in all the funds that we need, we've got a lot of money coming in from oil and gas, uh, and yet we have a lot of people who say, oh, get rid of oil and gas, you know, don't deal with that. So if we don't have that, then where are we? I don't feel that there's been enough research on what the downside of, of the marijuana is, uh, on the brain, et cetera. Uh, everybody says, oh, it's the money, it's the money. But I wanna know what, what's the downside of all of this too. And I think, and they say, well, until we get the money, we can't do the research to find out what the downside is. Well, uh, that to me is not the way to go about it, but, uh, I think there are a lot of people that are very enthusiastic about uh, the recreational marijuana. And then people say, well, it's gonna come anyway. Uh, well, I, and if it's gonna come anyway, I hope we'll be doing the research that we need to do to find out w what the downside is, particularly on the young brain and, uh, and, and uh, younger people using it. Because even though they put a, uh, an age level on- 21 years old. Yeah. 
can you tell me right now that that young people aren't smoking? Well, I mean, can you tell me right now that young people aren't drinking as that's well? That's what I'm saying. I mean, that, so, that's I mean, right. I that's what, what I'm saying. saying. So you don't support it. I get that. You support uh, medicinal Abs uh, absolutely. Uh, medical marijuana yes, in this absolutely. stage. Yes, uh, absolutely. Some folks have said, why not just let the people in New Mexico vote on this issue? Why not put it up on the ballot for the voters of New Mexico to consider? Would you support that? Uh, maybe. I'll have, I would want to look at it and see. The other thing is, you put it up there and people are, are, are want to do this uh, and but I still I am interested in finding out what the research is on what is the downside of, of, of other than the medicinal marijuana what is the downside in using in the use of marijuana so and I don't think I don't think that the money overshadows uh, what what are, would the health care issues be? What would the mental health issues be? I, I want to know what that is as well. Now, let's talk about health care, actually, uh, since we're kind of on that as well. Um, I, I want to uh, talk with you about legislation that you were involved with uh, to pursue prescription drugs uh, outside of the U.S. Um, yes. Tell me about the legislation and why you really feel it's needed here in New Mexico. Well, that was uh, Senate Bill 1. It was mm -hmm. the governor's bill. She asked me to carry it, and I was thrilled to do that. Uh, because, you know, I have a grandson that's mentally ill, uh, schizophrenic and bipolar, and he's on Latuda, and that's like $3,000 a month. Uh, of course, he's on Medicaid and Medicare and all of the other programs that that uh, help fund this but ha if you have to do the funding yourself on this sort of, of, of drugs or you're elderly and you're trying to get on the drugs that you need and the drugs are so expensive that you don't take the drugs uh, we need to f try and fix that I mean many people I there are busloads of, of, of uh, seniors that go to Palomas to buy their drugs yeah. because they're so much cheaper and so uh, I would hope that we would be able to, uh, to be able to make a contact and an agreement with Canada and be able to import those drugs. Now our viewers are probably aware of how personal of an issue, and you just brought it up, that behavioral health is to you. Uh, we heard a lot of talk about the state having this excess revenue this year, thanks to oil and gas. And uh, we of course have billions in the land grant permanent fund. Do you feel that behavioral health issues weren't really addressed in the appropriate way this legislative session? Not you, totally. Why not? Not totally. Well, uh, I had a bill, a Senate, I think it was Senate Bill 128, and it was a bill in trying to fix the different pieces of, of, of mental health in the state. I worked a lot with Secretary Scrace, who I uh, have a tremendous amount of faith in with HSD, and the bill was number three on the House side. We got it through the Senate, we got it all the way over, and then it was number three, and it sat there night after night after night after night and, and was never heard. Uh, Dr. Scrace has assured me that he got uh, sufficient funding, he believes, uh, in HSD that he's going to be able to implement many of the things that were going to be in this bill for mental health. So we'll see, and if not, you know, I'll carry the bill or a similar bill again next year. Part of it is is finding housing for people who are chronically mentally ill. Yeah, you bring up a key issue. I've done some reporting on this over the years, and the state, we only have really one facility to where we, at the northern part of the state, where we can house people who need that type of care. You've been serving in the Senate since 2001, I believe, so you can give me some good understand, some good perspective on this, our viewers' good perspective on this. Why don't we have one in another another hospital to meet these needs in New well, Mexico? Well, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, we were. I was at the meeting yesterday on the crisis triage center, and I stood up and I said, "If not, when? If not now, let's get it done." I mean, it's been out there for a long time. Uh, I think it, to put a hospital down here, and I, I'm. I'm not a big proponent of doing that. The reason is uh, when you take whatever it is, let's say it's 30 million, let's say it's 50 million, whatever it is to build a hospital, 
So you've taken that money out of the system. Then you're going to have to staff it. You have to furnish it before you ever get one patient in there. And I think our mental health needs are so great that if we've got that kind of money to put in a structure, why aren't we putting into the system to help the people that need the help and do the sort of things like housing uh, and, and trying to bring more psychiatrists in. They're all in Santa, in Santa Fe, Albuquerque area to try and get people down here uh, the numbers that we need. We need to be doing some of the things to try and get the you know, services, the services first. So you feel that it's just the services are not being met right now? I think the services, they're trying to meet the services. I know La Clinica is working very hard at providing the services. Uh, but isn't but housing was, key? Isn't uh, housing key? Because we have so many families here in southern oh, New I think Mexico housing is key. in our area that have to travel all the way or may not have the means to travel all the way to the north to visit their own family members. Well, Why isn't housing key? If we, uh, you're talking about, you're not talking about housing. Full-time care. You're talking about hospital care. Yes. Uh, you know, I think if we could have more services here and if we can get the crisis triage going and if we can also work out some sort of a system with the, ho with the hospitals, the mental health hospitals that we have now and say Memorial or whatever hospitals we have here, if we can get beds here uh, and we also need to have the psychiatrists here, we need to have the, the professional staff here to be able to handle this uh, with the numbers that we have because very often when you, my, my grandson uh, has been there and generally they're there three days, five days of a week till they get them stabilized and then they're released. So can we stabilize them with the, within the facilities that we have now if we can uh, uh, contract for so many beds that we have these beds here and, that, and make a strong effort to bring the professionals here that we need to have to be able to do that. Uh, it, it, but to me, once you get out of Las Vegas, let's say you've been there three weeks, I mean three days or a week, and then you're sent home, we need to have those services, the handoff services, so that when you come home, that you're into a program, that, the, that you are into some sort of housing, whether it's with your families or whether there is housing that we develop ourselves here where people who with mental illness can go. And we need to make sure that people are gonna stay on their medication. Mm -hmm. And because once you get out, if, uh, if you're given a bus ticket or your family picks you up and you don't stay on your medication, it's just a matter of time before you're gonna cycle back down again and be back in Las Vegas. So we need those ancillary services to be able to stabilize and keep people stabilized. I obviously so many challenges. There are a lot of challenges. Issue. I only have a few lots. minutes left, but I want to talk with you about something that didn't happen this legislative session. And that was uh, the repeal of the state tax on social security. I'd like to hear where you stand on that issue and why you feel that failed. Well, uh, you know, the reason, the reason I think it failed was I think next year, I think there's going to be a concerted effort to look at our tax structure. And I think that, that there was a feeling that we're piecemealing. Let's take the tax off of this. Let's increase this tax. We, we do the solar tax. Let's do this tax. Let's do that tax. So that we keep repealing these small taxes. But how does that affect the overall picture of what our taxes are? So I think that was probably the reason it didn't pass. I think for seniors, you've already paid the taxes on it one time around. Uh, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, but I also am hoping that that will be part of the package that hopefully that we will be presenting next year. Okay, now I also want to talk with you uh, about another issue briefly that was brought up and somebody in your position, it would be really great to get your perspective uh, as somebody in leadership is that is the issue of paying state lawmakers in New Mexico. Obviously, our viewers may know that uh, lawmakers do not get paid, they get per diem uh, when they serve in uh, the state Senate and uh, state House of Representatives. And there's been uh, some action or call to make that happen to where we can pay state lawmakers. Your thoughts on that? 
Well, I, th I think I, th I think the, the advantage of paying lawmakers would be that maybe there would be more people who would feel that they could serve. And I think that's, I think that's always an important issue is, is people say, well, I can't afford to leave my job and go up there and only get per diem or if I leave my job. I think the only people that really, and I may be wrong on this, but, but school teachers have always been able to, get to uh, not lose their job and to stay involved. But I think that, uh, that we, need to, we need to be looking. I know Gov Governor Carruthers, former Governor Carruthers, uh, I think has been very interested in doing this. He also serves on the Ethics Commission, and I think they're, they're looking at it. Uh, I, I think often things come up in, in a session, and I, I want to see them vetted very well before we actually do it. I, good ideas, but I want to see the good ideas uh, vetted more to, to look at that, and I, and I think it would offer an opportunity for more people to serve. All right, now I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us on your legislators, Senator Papin, and uh, we wish you the best uh, after this legislative session so you can get some rest now. Thank you yes, so much for you. your time. Thank you, thank you very much. And we want to thank you for joining us on your legislators. Don't forget, you can always send us your feedback. Email us at feedback at nmsu.edu for this program or our other programs here on television from KRWG Public Media. We're on social media as well. You can always like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to the KRWG News YouTube channel where you can watch past episodes of Your Legislators. Thank you for joining us this season. I'm Anthony Morneau. We'll see you next time.